All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to um, an interesting lecture today. <laughs> um, I'm, I am John English. I'm here with Timmy Trabon. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what I'm going to, uh, what I've done, and maybe uh, give you some kind of uh, background of why I know a little bit about this. Um, Timmy is my co-founder uh, co and partner with uh, Visual Arts Passage and the Illustration Academy. He wasn't a co-founder. Not a co-founder. I don't think he was alive. <laughs> no, I was not. I was, <laughs> yes, uh, yes, you were. It was 27 years ago. Okay. Um, I, was a, I was a toddler. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I founded the Illustration Academy with my father in 1995. Uh, so uh, Timmy, Timmy was just a child, uh, or a young child. Um, I've been I've been an illustrator and a painter uh, s since I started working in 1982. Um, I was 22 years old, and uh, I've been doing it. I've been making a living as an artist since I was 22 years old. And um, the things I've learned along the way, I've been blessed uh, uh, from having a career that allowed me to do what I wanted to do most of the time. Um, but I, more than anything, I, I've been surrounded by really great artists most of my life. Uh, my, my father was a phenomenal illustrator and painter, very, very well known. If you research me, you're going to run into him really quickly. And then I'm the addendum to that. <laughs> so um, I'm going to show you a quick, uh, uh, about 10 images of my work, uh, just kind of verify what I've done. This was an illustration work that I did. It's a piece I did for a book cover in probably 1990. Um, this is something I did this year uh, during a, a illustration isolation. Um, I worked on it a little bit afterwards, but um, drawing and painting is is a, in the practice of drawing and painting has always been a part of my life uh, since as a professional. Uh, landscape uh, for a gallery. Uh, this was something else that was done in illustration isolation. Um, it's funny, it's one, of, it's one of my, it's one of the more simple ones, but one of my favorite ones. Um, painting for a gallery, another painting. Actually, this was not for a gallery. This was originally used as a book cover and uh, as, a, as a Western cover. This was an illustration I did for Esquire magazine years ago. One of six for, the, for that issue. Another drawing uh, from Illustration Isolation. Um, I like to show um, things that I've just done. Um, I think it's important. This is something I did for a hotel. It's a study for the biggest painting I've ever done. The, this one's about two feet square. The, the, the painting itself, uh, the finish is eight feet square. This is a painting I did. I actually did at the Illustration Academy as a demonstration. Uh, it's of the James River in Richmond, Virginia, when we were on BCU's campus. Okay, the reason we're here is what you need to know about art school. And um, I've learned, <laughs> not knowingly, or not, not, not maybe not, uh, it wasn't my plan, <laughs> but I had to figure it out. And, um, you know, Timmy and I build kind of non-traditional art education. Uh, the goal of the Visual Arts Passage and the Illustration Academy has always been to help people develop career. And we see many students that go to art and design schools. We see many students that are self-taught. We, we uh, you know, we do portfolio review, hundreds and hundreds of portfolio reviews a year. And I think I have a very good take on how to approach and what to look for. Um, and the advantages and disadvantages of, of, of how you should educate yourself. So um, first thing I will say is don't be a passenger. You know, you can't, um, you can't like an, let an institution just make a decision for you. Uh, you're purchasing the education. You need to control your education. There's some very, it's, 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 and it's almost even more so in the arts, it's, it's, it's a little awkward um, because the degree is not mandatory. Um, our industry is a non-degree bearing industry. Most people never get asked where they went to school or to certainly never get asked, it's, unless they're doing something academically, teaching, um, 
or if it's uh, one of the major caveats of that might be is if you're looking for a visa to to work in a certain country. But the um, the industry is pretty much driven by portfolio. It's the quality of your portfolio. And portfolio has impact in the industry. It also has impact in applying to art school. And it's where you know, almost all scholarships come from the quality of your portfolio, assuming you can meet their um, expectations of what their bare minimum is for grades. The portfolio is the determining factor. And so the better portfolio you have, either for art school, is it going to benefit you in a huge way, or the better portfolio in the industry, it's going to benefit you in a huge way. Portfolio is everything in the industry. Um, you can't talk your way around anything. It's all about what your capabilities are and what you and what you can do. Um, I was just, I was just going to ask because um, I know we were curious about this. We're just uh, I just have a quick poll. Um, I'm just curious, like who is considering art school? What uh, what schools are you considering? Um, if you're considering a specific school, like let us know in the chat. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, we'd love to know. Very cool. Yeah. Thank you for doing that, Timmy. Yeah, of course. It's great that we can get a feel for our audience. Yeah, it helps, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, choosing the right art school. Um, you know, there's very specific schools that have great reputations for doing certain things. Um, I'll use uh, Cal Arts as an example. If I were, if somebody asked me, what is my best chance? Of developing as an animator, I would say go to CalArts. It's it has, and CalArts does more so than any other school, any other art school uh, for their animation program. They do what I think is most important. They have the industry teach their classes. It's filled. Those classes are taught by people from Pixar and Disney, and um, working artists teaching the teaching the classes. Um, our program, Visual Arts and Illustration Academy, it's always been taught by leading, not just working artists, but industry leaders. And my theory from the beginning is there's information that the people working in the industry have, whether if, whether if it's timely or if it, it, you know, the accuracy is dead on. It's what they do day in and day out. And I don't want people to teach in our program that just teach art. I want people that teach that have a successful career. And I think it's, I think it's, it's uh, a necessity to learn from people that do it day in and day out. The information is gonna be better and it's gonna be current. Um, what part of the industry do you don't wanna work in? Um, both, even for art school, I think it's really, I know it's hard to make a commitment because you may not know that much about it. You may be so oh, I'm just interested in making art. I think that it's worth taking the time and before you make that commitment of going to an art school is to figure out what part of the industry you want to work in. Um, again, just as I said, animation, there's nobody that competes with, with uh, Cal Arts in the animation world. Um, uh, the illustration programs at, uh, um, at, uh, Ringling and at uh, uh, College for Creative Studies are excellent. If I was telling you illustration, their game art programs are both excellent. Um, uh, SVA has got a great illustration pro program that is, it's a little bit more aimed at uh, conceptual illustration, but these are things you can figure out by looking at the schools and learning a little bit about the industry. The most important thing to learn about the industry is Who's making the art? And then figure, try to figure out what their education was, how they learned. Um, you're going to see a lot of people that are making art in the industry that didn't go to school, uh, that they, they were self-taught. And they, and they again, they took control of their education by learning from people from the industry. And John, and, when, you, when you even say not only, it doesn't just stop at what was their education, but maybe what do they attribute their careers to? Because, you know, we've met, people who have had, edu you know, they've studied at certain schools, but then they maybe wouldn't recommend somebody taking that same path, you know? 
Oh yeah. Oh, we've had we've had uh, yeah. a, a lot of students that come into our program. <laughs> uh, Timmy, I laugh about this all the time. We have several students now enrolled in our program that are going to private art and design colleges because they're wanting the connection to the industry, and we offer that. Um, the um, um, again, what's right for you? I mean, you may be in a situation where you have to, you know, we have one of our, our, our uh, Omar uh, Hisham, who's, who's about to, who's just teaching our first 3D class for us. Um, he's, he's not from the United States. He, he wanted to go, he wanted to work in the entertainment industry and he wanted to be a 3D model. He wanted to do character. And, uh, and it ended up being, a, he is now a 3D character artist. That's his main focus. Um, but he came to the, where he was living, he, they did not have the right education. So he came to the States and he went to school here in the United States. And for him to stay here and work in the industry, he had to get a visa, which means he had to get a job right away. Um, so everybody has different, you have to look at what your needs are. Um, if you want to work as an illustrator in the publishing, the traditional illustration world, do magazine and book illustration, that is an industry that's driven by freelance artists. Uh, there's, there, there are not studios uh, wrapped around that part of the industry. There's 99% there's of that work is done by independent artists. And so, which has great advantages. You can live anywhere in the world and do that, um, but you don't have a full-time job. So there's all kinds of other information you have to garner to, to basically run a small business wrapped around you as an artist. And you have to take just as much care in that as, as the artwork. So you have to really make good decisions. You have to, to, to try to um, plan out as much as you can plan out. Making a commitment for an education is a huge thing. Um, again, what schools offer the appropriate skill sets? What schools produce industry professionals? Um, you know, there's, there's big art schools, I refer to them as mills, that publicize that they're going to help you develop a career in this. And they, they have the lowest um, uh, production of professional artists. Um, they're horrible at it. Um, some of the, you know, there's, there, there are, there are good places that has good information that you can, you can get quality information. Um, research the industry. I can't say that enough. Know what you're getting into. Um, and then Pick the direction that serves you best. Um, look at your personal needs. Look at you know your personality. Look at what you want to do. The bottom line is, you're an, you, you want to make a living as an artist. Uh, the making the living part is sometimes uh, contrary to the art part, but you got to make them work together. But you cannot. I don't care how ta wildly talented or intelligent somebody is. You cannot pick a part of the industry that you're not interested in just because you think you can get more work. You got to be an artist first. You got to choose the direction that you want to do the most. The tough part is that when you're learning, it's like you don't know what you don't know. So you don't know what exists out there. So put as much time into researching as possible. Um, the, the portfolio for an artist is their job interview. It's the thing that attracts attention. It's the thing that an art director or um, a creative director is gonna determine if you can work and be beneficial to that organization, either on a freelance basis or on a full-time hire in a studio. Um, so I'm gonna move forward here. Um, at least I think I am. Uh, these are things to consider. I can, and, and again, Feel free, Timmy. I, I don't know if there's been any questions. Feel free to ask questions about this. We have a few uh, questions, but I think I think they'll be good to unpack a little bit. Okay. Later. Okay. Good. Um, what do you want want or need from an education? You know, there's as I said, there's people that live in places where there's no art jobs. So you're going to have to, if you want, you're going to have to make the decision. Am I willing to move? Do I want to be in a part of the industry that I can work at a distance? Um, you got you got to make those type of decisions. What type of an artist do you want to be? Uh, private art schools, universities, and junior colleges. I mean, they're all options. They all have their strengths and weaknesses. 
uh, private art school. They have great information. They're incredibly uh, exclusive because of their price. Um, the, it's the most expensive form of education that exists on this planet. <laughs> um, and that's a, that's, a huge, that's a huge issue. There are some universities that have good programs in them. Um, junior colleges, um, there's, there's information across the board. You have to decide. And then there's also places like what Timmy and I built, a non-traditional education. And not just us. There's other good programs out there. Yeah. Um, yeah they're, they're I don't, I'm not going to bring their names up. But yeah. so I know. I don't care. I'm so I, I don't care. School you can is figure it. Yeah, yeah, you can figure That's it out. Easy. That's the easy yeah. part. You can figure that out on your you own. You can figure that stuff out. But there, <laughs> there's, you know, there's other good classes out there. Um, the reason we exist is because it doesn't happen that private art school universities and junior colleges um, don't offer what we offer. Um, they don't offer what, you know, if you're concept artists, uh, what Nomon offers. There's very specific things that you can get from these non-traditional education programs. But the one thing I'm going to bring up that Timmy and I are both huge fans of education. I've devoted a huge chunk of my life to it. Education, this is not just drawing and painting and learning design and learning materials. It's learning, you know, the, a BFA program is 80% art and 20%, or so no, it's more, it's a, it's a third, two thirds art and a third a liberal arts. The liberal arts component may be the most important aspect of it to it. Your, your job as an illustrator or a concept artist is, is you're either a storyteller or a problem solver. So developing that side of yourself is extremely important. Um, so don't um, don't write that part off. Um, yeah, John, what you were saying, I feel like it's easy for it to sound like, you know, this is an anti-education thing and it's not. What I would say is, is think of it like a sea voyage. We are not against adventure or exploring, but the ocean is dangerous, <laughs> <laughs> right? That, that is, I think that this, we're preparing you to enter the jungle, if that makes sense. This, this, and this next thing that, you know, there, again, the non-traditional programs are things that I've put my heart and soul into for the last quarter of a century. We've had wild success. I mean, I, I, I and I always, I joke about it, but I'll challenge, I don't, I won't just challenge an art and design college. I'll challenge all of the art and design colleges and match them and say, you want to compete with our, the, the success of our students? They can't. Um, we've blown them out of the water. A lot of them have gone to art and design school first. So they're using it as, as, as part of their education. Um, but, but developing careers has been our focus. So this is, this is the part you really got to pay attention to. And this dawned on me during a talk I was giving at an art school one day, and I'm listening to the students they're, 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 I have the juniors and seniors in this talk and they're asking me questions about the industry. And I, I just blurted it out. And I said, have you all ever considered why you're taking a, 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 your, and your education is wrapped around a bachelor of fine arts degree when you wanna go into industry? Now you can't tell me the animation world, the entertainment arts, the gaming world, and the illust traditional illustration world. It's all industry. It is, it, it has very specific rights and wrongs and rules and hiring practices. Um, why are you taking it? Why are you taking an educate? Why are you paying for an education with a bachelor of fine arts? And the truth is, bachelor for the next line there, bachelor of fine arts has no gainful employment. Art schools never have to prove anybody ever gets a job. And if I was doing a school, uh, delivering a school that wrapped into traditional education, I would probably approach the same way because without that, they're all going to fail. Um, the success of, you know, if 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 you went to if you went to study accounting, sixty percent of the students that take those courses in your accounting courses have to get jobs in that area of study. That would never happen in an art school. They would all fail. Uh, I understand that, but you have to be aware of that and know that you have to go outside of that school 
to get the to learn about the industry practices because they avoid the industry because it's again they don't want to attach gainful employment to their to their education. I get it; it makes sense. It's been around forever, but I I always just question. It's like why, why you know somebody that's taking a a route of becoming a fine artist, an installation artist, or a sculptor, or a, a even a even a a, a painter, and um, that's approaching commercial gallery. It is so difficult, and so few people have success at doing that. But on the industry side, what they call the commercial side, there's huge success. There's, I mean, the games business has more money than God right now. It's like, it's, it's, it is, it is a place that's, that is, it's huge success. And so there should be a, there should be conversation about how that works. And so I think it's kind of contrary. And, and again, I, 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 it angers me that schools that, you know, they'll promote, say, hey, learn this for career. And it's like, we'll teach you some of the timeless information, but we're not going to teach you the career information, the things you really need to know to get a job. And we're not going to introduce you to the industry. So understand that. And that's, that's why places like what Timmy, the education that Timmy and I build and others build, that's why we're successful, because there's a huge need for it. Um, most industry jobs don't require a degree. No, there's very few that do. Um, and the ones that do are usually attached to, that relate to people, uh, production that goes overseas where you have to travel overseas uh, or um, uh, a visa of some sort. Um, be willing to customize your education. Don't, again, as I was saying from the beginning, don't just say one path is going to get you there. Um, John, you, you want to say something? Go ahead. Yeah, I was, well, it's a question uh, on your previous one with uh, industry art jobs not requiring a degree. I know that's definitely true for like freelancing industry for illustration. Um, at certain studios, do they often look for some type of degree? Very seldom. Really? Very seldom. Um, the 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 driver and it's not. It's not it, it's not, not a necessity. Yeah. No, it's not a necessity and it's not a deal breaker. The thing that is the deal breaker is the quality of your portfolio. You no consideration without the portfolio, without a professional portfolio. Sure. And that, that is that is the driver. And that is the thing that's going to get you to where you want to go. Um, again, there's a reason art schools don't introduce you to the industry. Again, they can't do everything. They can't. Um, but they're going to avoid that because they're going to they want to keep their BFA accreditation. Um, now there's some there's there, and, and I've, I've I've had pushback on that in which and again I know people that teach in some of the art schools I'm going to show you some of my best friends teach at those schools some of my past students are chairs of those departments they teach the information they learn from us in those departments which I think is really cool um, the um, it is, it is, uh, yeah, I'm kind of lying. Hold on a second. Um, art schools don't introduce you to the industry. I'm trying to figure out, there was a question wrapped in there, Timmy, and I started to talk about it and I lost my train. It's like, what, yeah, well, like I was, well, I had been curious about studios and their interest and like what, what that level was at. And I knew that that was, was definitely lower. One of the, you know, while you think about that, one of the questions that, you know, I am asked pretty frequently, I would say, um, especially by younger students, um, considering visual arts passage is like, can you guarantee placement in the industry or, you know, and, and one of those things that the, the answer to that question is, is beware of anyone who promises you that because they can't. No, um, absolutely and, not. And there, there's no guarantees. And at the end of the day, like what you were saying, John, is it all boils down to portfolio. And until you put the work in and uh, learn the skills that you need to build that portfolio, um, you won't find a place in the industry. Uh, it's not the GPA. It's not the certification. It's not the paperwork. It's, it's ultimately what is your portfolio. Yeah. And the other, the other aspect of that is, um, you know, there's a couple of schools that uh, one in particular, Rhode Island School of Design, uh, it's 
you know, it's sister school is Brown. They got phenomenal. Uh, they got a phenomenal liberal arts program and their art program is quite good too. It's also insanely expensive. Um, if you can have, if you want that experience and that's important to you, do it. Um, a lot of the um, opportunities, a lot of the, the classes that you can get from junior college can satisfy, you know, liberal arts, the, the liberal arts components on it. Even if you use them to transfer or you just learn them to learn yourself. Um, most illustrators and concept artists that I know, and in fact, all illustrators and concept artists that I know that work at the, the highest part of the industry, um, they're all very intelligent people. They, they, um, they can talk about history, they can talk about literature, they, can, they, they have a really good understanding of how the world works. It's part of their job. Um, it's part of their visual communicators. Don't look past that. Um, some of the best students that we've ever produced, we offering them most of what their art education is, but they've gone through liberal arts programs. They come from universities and they had, they had a better understanding, a deeper well to pull from to problem solve. And that's extremely important. Um, you know, that there's one other thing I'll bring up and that is, uh, people talking about the experience of the college experience. Um, art school is not the normal college experience. Yeah. Most of the art schools don't have like a hub. They don't have a community that that's wrapped around a campus that much, you know, yeah. SVA spread all out over all over New York city, uh, San, uh, San Academy of art. It's all over. They got buildings all over the place. Um, there is not, it's not the traditional education or the, or the liberal arts experience. Uh, I went to a liberal arts college. I went to a university and um, it was way different than art school. <laughs> I've taught at a couple of different art schools and it was a completely different makeup. Um, so it's, it, 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 it can be a good experience too. Art school, I mean, I, I'm gonna say it, it, art school can be a great experience. Um, I, think okay. what, I think what we were talking about and you and I have talked about this a lot is a, a lot of like intention and goals. And uh, one of the things I think about is like, what are your intentions with art school? If it's, uh, you know, I think that there was a pretty incredible marketing, uh, <laughs> a marketing initiative years ago, particularly when I went to college, which was you, it's, it's a social experience. It's a, um, the college experience. It's an experience. It's uh, something you can only do once, you know, in your life. And I think it's, that's a, um, a pretty big distraction for what it really should be be and what you're paying for and what the experience is. And I kind of think of it as like, well, if your goal is, it's important to remember that goal, which is you want a career in illustration, you want a career in, in the entertainment and game arts um, and figure out what that compass is to keep your eye on that goal. Because if you just get on the trail and start hiking and you're just looking down in front of your feet, you'll go off, uh, <laughs> you might, <laughs> you're gonna end up on the wrong trail pretty quickly yeah um and so yeah sorry john no no that's no that's totally fine good good great points um most graduates from the best of art and design schools aren't prepared for the industry um some of the, our faculty members that we have went to really good art and design schools but they came to our program afterwards and that helped them that assisted them to um develop a portfolio that was professional. It assisted them to figure out how the industry worked. Um, there's very few students that walk out of art and design school that are prepared for the industry, that are industry ready. There's always a gest, almost always a gestation time of that you have to build and work to figure out, okay, now, now I'm done with school, now how do I be a professional? Um, I think that it should happen midway through your education. You should think about the professional portfolio. That's what you should be focusing on when you're in school. Most people don't. Most people get out of school and they're obviously, their portfolios are obviously student portfolios. Um, even the assignments themselves are student, student assignments. They're not professional assignments. Um, these last two, if you, have, if, if you got a ton of money and you don't have to think about it, cover your ears. Um, but um, I don't care how good you are starting out in the industry. You cannot be saddled with a heavy debt. 
and I don't, I, and, and I don't care how great your experience of college was. I've seen some of the best artists come out of really expensive schools and they have incredible debt and they had to change direction just because of the debt. Um, they were paying a mortgage when they got the, you know, what do you, what was the moratorium? What, uh, uh, eight months or 12 months before you had to start paying your um, student loans. And, and it was like, I can't work in this part of the industry. I can't do comics and start to, and, and pay, pay this loan back with making comics from a, a new comic artist. The, the, the industry is not there for that. Um, it's not designed that way. So you have to approach, you have to think about this. Being an artist is running a business and then you're investing in yourself as a business and taking on a huge debt to start a business in this industry is not a wise, wise decision. Again, if you have money and your parents are paying for it or grandparents are paying for it, it's a wholly different, it's a different decision. Um, you know, also the thing and it, it infuriates me is art schools scream all the time that we are the most in inclusive. They want to, everything is happy and friendly and we're inclusive and we're doing everything right. And then you look at them and say, but nobody can go to your schools because they're so expensive. You're not inclusive, you're exclusive. And that's really infuriating to me. So anyway, things to think about, all good stuff to think about. Like I said, like I said earlier, it's preparing you for the rough ocean. You know, it's just, you, you can't have this conversation without talking about those red flags, you know? Um, again, a lot of, this is funny. Some, some of my, not some of, most of my best friends are artists. <laughs> And uh, people I've been working with for years and people I've taught with or were students of mine at one point, um, I had a different situation in my life. As a young man, as a young artist, an emerging artist, I had all the information. Um, my father was the most seen illustrator in the world when I, got, when I started working. And he knew everybody, he knew the rights and wrongs, and he told me it was hard. It was still really hard, um, even with all that information. And I look at people that are my age, somebody like George Pratt, and I look and I always ask him this question, and I, you know, you know, I was fascinated. It's like we ended up kind of at the same place, we're the same age, about 10 or 12 years later, and he goes, oh, God, I wish I had that. The, the pain I went through, it was so much harder for him having to figure all that stuff out. Mm -hmm. And that's how the Illustration Academy came to be. It's like filling in those gaps of that information George was looking for. I love the fact that these great artists, somebody like Bill Sienkiewicz, you know, one of the most seen comics in the world, comes to the Illustration Academy for the first time and he looks around in his first words out of his mouth, he goes, where was this when I was 25 years old? This, I would have killed for this. This is what I needed. This is the information I needed. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to give you the required information to work in the industry, the rest of it. Um, okay, the things, you, the things you have to research. And beyond researching the industry, I'm gonna come uh, um, the artists that, you've, that you admire that work in the industry. First of all, make sure they're industry artists. Make sure they're just not, they're not trying to be, they're not doing what you're trying to do. They're putting themselves out on social media. John, how many people, how many people do we know that have over, you know, 150,000 followers on Instagram? And then I've talked with them, you talk to them. They're not, they don't have a revenue. They, they make no money from the industry. Yeah, um, they're, but, but from the outside, I mean, you're shocked to hear it. When you hear it, you're like, wait, what? How do you, you know? And yet, you know, it's, it does not mean that they're successful. Start, start from the industry. Look at the industry. If you don't know what Spectrum is, you don't know what the Society of Illustrators is or Communication Arts Magazine, those are resource books for our industry. If you don't know what Lightbox is, research all that stuff. Lightbox is an incredible event that happens in the fall of a group of industry uh, professionals. Spectrum, Society of Illustrators, Communication Arts, those are published 
shows of the best work of the industry. And they're difficult to get in, but you can see who's doing what and succeeding in the industry. You can also see who they made the work for and many times who the art directors are. As, a, as an artist, you learn that art directors run our industry. They're the people that you're trying to pursue to make a living from. Um, knowing who they are is a huge benefit. That's that's those are the people that you're going to be chasing, um, so that that and to be to be able to prove to them that you can do the work that they have to offer. Um, so, starting, we're going to start go back to the school thing here. Uh, portfolio requirements. You can go to any of the art schools, colleges, universities, and find out what their portfolio requirements are online. I'll show you an example of a couple of them here in just a minute. Uh, the thing that's going to serve you the most, assuming you have your grade, the grades to get into the school, um, which many of the art schools, the, the barrier is very low. Some of them are, are at 2.0, some of them are 2.5. Some of the best schools are like 2.5. There's only a few that are like 3.0 or higher. Um, maybe, well, only two that I know of. Uh, most of them are very low. And uh, assuming the grades are there, it's the portfolio of where the scholarships and reduced tuition comes from. So the better your portfolio, just like in the industry, the more potential, the, the lower your tuition is going to be. <laughs> um, you, you have the potential of, of giving, getting scholarship or reduced tuition. Um, so really research that and figure that out. Uh, and then also, if you say that, that every college is different. Is it, it is yeah. absolutely, and everybody has their the ones that I'm aware of, and I can say uh, there are quite a few of them, especially that's wrapped around the illustration and game arts. Um, portfolios very very important in in receiving scholarship, um, and then look at the connection of the school. Um, again, as I was saying, I use Cal Arts as an example. We don't teach anim animation, so I can talk about Cal Arts all I want. <laughs> There's no conflict. But they do things right. And you're going to be learning from people that work in the industry. Uh, how many people come into our program, Timmy? I'll ask you this question because of who our faculty are. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, it's huge. They want to they want to study with Sterling Hunley or uh, uh, Dale Stefanos or Catherine Lamb or Audrey Benjamin Benjaminson or or on the concept side John Nymeister or Vivian Kosky or uh, Lake Hurwitz. Those are notable people in the industry. And it's amazing how quickly you know every uh, every generation that comes through uh, information. Uh, in my opinion, seems to date faster. Um, everything is moving at a faster pace. And so the more you can tap in directly to the industry, the better, especially people who are just recently figured out how to get in the industry, uh, which like, you know, when you talk about Sterling, you're talking about a technician who is established, but the way that Sterling broke into the industry is different than Catherine Lane, right? Oh, very, very much so. Same concept, uh, different, yeah. different mechanisms. But, but ultimately what you're learning is you're learning more fact and less theory, which, right. you know, this is, this is how you do it. Mm -hmm. um, which theory is helpful. Yep. Theory, there's nothing, I'm not going to complain about theory, but, um, but fact is, can be a little bit better. That's right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I've been, I've had conversations looking at people's portfolio reviews and the information I've been told, like, people where they've gotten their information from and, and what they're talking about. I'm just like, oh my God, who have you been talking to? Um, and then figure out that they're, they're talking to, to people that don't work in the industry. And it, there, there's, there's rhymes and reasons to what happens in, in the industry. And you gotta, re, you gotta hear it from the voice. The voice has to come from the industry. Um, there's a couple of people have asked just for clear, just to clarify the Academy was a workshop that we did in person, um, the Illustration Academy. Um, and that was a four to five week long workshop, um, which has changed pretty rapidly since COVID or pretty dramatically since COVID 
Like uh, we haven't been able to have it. <laughs> yeah. So uh, everything we're talking about now, if you're asking about the portfolio or like, you know, how you build a portfolio, um, we're talking about building portfolio to, we're going to dig into, you know, developing that portfolio for a college or developing a portfolio for a career. Um, but if you are curious, Visual Arts Passage, just to clarify, we offer mentorships that help you build a portfolio in um, as little as 12 months. Uh, a portfolio is a, that might sound like a long time, but a portfolio is something that many people spend years developing. And it could be a long journey to build a, because that portfolio isn't really done. It's a moving it starts, target. It, it's until it starts getting you work. Yeah. And, um, and even then it's not done, it's growing. It's like you said, it's a moving target. And it's, it's the only thing, the quality of your work that will, will yeah. allow you to start getting work. Yeah. Um, I jokingly say this, I repeat this. My, my father used to say this to students all the time. People would ask him, Mark, what's the best way to get started in the industry? And he was serious when he said, <laughs> but everybody thought he was just teasing. He would say the fastest. <laughs> and yeah. and I, I want, I'm going to expand that uh, or expound on that a little bit um and the fastest eliminates so if the quicker you get started in the industry the fewer problems you have um the longer you chase it that is what i see kill most uh artists dreams or or their careers is time um the longer that takes somebody to do it the less the more likelihood that life gets in the way, you know, whether it's finance, uh, I always say it's finance, finance first, it's romance second. Um, there's, there's, <laughs> there's life, there's life, practical life issues. It's like, how long can you trace, chase a dream before you give up on it? And so the sooner you get, you, you start, and again, I, I, I say this a lot too, and we, we've, Jadale and I've joked about it in uh, isolation recently. It's like, I've, I've been fortunate to be around all these great artists most of my life. There's not one of them. Uh, and recently um, I've tested this, that I could ask the question, when did you start making a living as an artist? And they can tell, even if it was 30 years ago, they'll tell you the month and the year that they started making a living as an artist because it changed their life. All they had to do is focus on the artwork at that point. They weren't, they weren't working a second job. They weren't doing something to try to figure out how to get in the industry. Once you get there, then, then it solves the practical aspects of your life. And getting, getting there can be tricky. And so it's really, and, and my, my dad's remark of the fastest, I think was very is a was a, is a great way to explain it. I know it needs more detail, but he was dead serious when he answered it that way. Um, and then again, uh, figure out how to connect with like potential inter internships and industry connections. Um, know the you know you can just start with the events industry events to go and introduce yourself and meet people. Um, your job being an artist is like I mean, this is a I think it's a fair, fairly comparable analogy. It's like show and tell. You make things and then you have to show them to people. Nobody's ever gonna, nobody's ever gonna hire you for talking about something. It's gonna be what your abilities are to make something. And so you gotta get in the habit, in the practice of going out, putting yourself out there, introducing yourself to, to industry people, talking to them, learning about, what you need to do to become better, become better, and to become a professional. Um, I like to think that we load our students. Uh, Timmy, we just went over this. That we this was this was a real fun conversation because we had all of our ten week mentorship classes for the concept program and the illustration program. We have three guest speakers, and you can. We just started a couple of semesters ago that the whatever the other program was, if you're an illustrator, you could watch the concept guest speakers on demand because all the classes happen at the same time. So you could only see them on demand. You couldn't see them live. And so we started separating that and started saying, okay, we think this is a huge value that we do those classes on a different date so that you can have six 
guest speakers in 10 weeks. I mean, and we're not talking about, we're talking like industry legends that come into that program. We have Chris, right. Chris Ron. Good question, John. How much more are we charging because we're doing that? None. none. <laughs> <laughs> Most well, people would have seen a business opportunity. Yeah, I know. That's, yeah, you have a, some artists that are running the, the shop that sometimes yeah. not wise uh, <laughs> from our end. Uh, but it allows us, so in a 10 week session, you get your 10 classes, you get three additional guest speakers, you get um, a three, another 10 classes that we, we have a, a study hall in the middle of the week where all of our classes come together and the concept instructors and students and illustration instructors and students are there at the same time. So you get to talk to people in different parts of the industry, you meet lots of industry people. That may be the most important thing we do. Get rid of all the lessons, just exposing you to all the opportunities that happen in the industry. That's huge. If you can do, if you can go to industry events, again, if you can get into those, dig through those resource books and start figuring out who, what artists are making what for whom, what, what publishers, what studios, what art directors, that's important information. That's understanding the industry. So I'm gonna keep rolling here. Yeah, how are we doing on time, John? I'm doing great. Yeah, we're okay. <laughs> cleared the whole day. I don't even like. I got all night. <laughs> I, I, I can keep going. I was worried that first page. I could still be talking about that first page. Yeah. Um, okay, so here's an example of two of my favorite colleges um, for what what they what they teach. Uh, Ringling College of Art and Design, great school. I have good friends that work there. I did a, my summer program there for five years. Uh, they produce good. They produce good product. Um, this is their application. This is what they're looking for in a portfolio. And all schools have these examples. This is not very specific. When we created our foundations class, which is now the fundamentals of illustration, um, illustration for beginners, um, this is what we like to focus on in our class. People use that class to develop a portfolio. They use that class to prepare themselves to go into our full program and to go into Catherine Lamb's class in our process and skill and craft class. Um, it is the, the, the fundamentals, the most important kind of quick look at the information that you need to know that's gonna make you a better artist the quickest. Um, so that's an example. I'm gonna keep going forward here. For anybody who's um, wondering what John's talking about, I dropped a link to that class in the chat. You can I'm going to talk more about it at the end of this because it's where I'm going to it's how I'm going to show you where a lot of the information that you should be trying to garner right now. Um, and again, you'll see some of these a lot of this is based around observational drawing. Drawing from life, direct observation. These can include hands, feet, human figures, animals, representational drawing, drawing from life. And interior, that's all about drawing. And they want to, they want to see that you have that skill. Um, there's other things that they love to see. I've sat on these review boards uh, at two different colleges before. You, they, want to, they also like to know that you understand a little bit about process. Process is a personal picture maker. Process is understanding also the industry process, the act of making a picture with an art director, the things that you, you know, learning how to do thumbnail, learning how to do value studies, learning how to do color studies. They love to see that. They love to see the fact that you carry a sketchbook. Um, those are all really important things to have in your portfolio. If you could show that you have a good drawing skill, because drawing is the most important tool especially on the illustration side, but I believe it is on the concept side too. If you have those drawing skills and you can pair your drawing skills with a narrative or, or a concept, then you can be, be, begin to be a visual communicator. Um, but it all starts with drawing. Um, this is, a, I, I pulled this page. This is from the Department of Education uh, down at the bottom. I love this. This is the average cost. Uh, this is the tuition and housing. This is the annual year at, at Ringling, $71,000. Harvard is $1,500 more. Uh, you're, you're muted, Timmy. Just to confirm, this is a screenshot, right? This is a screenshot. Okay. 
These are not my numbers. This is from, I got this yeah, yesterday. I want to confirm. Department of Education. Uh, after just for the recording. <laughs> after, just for the attorneys. <laughs> <laughs> after um, you, you deal with the average student, uh, the, the amount of scholarships and reduced tuitions they give away, the average student pays $49,000, almost $50,000 a year. I did not put Harvard's up, but the average student attending Harvard only pays $18,000 a year. Why is that? Because art schools, they're, they have no, um, yeah, their small. endowments are very small. Harvard has the largest endowment of any school on the planet. They could, they don't have to charge tuition if they didn't want to. We say many art schools have small endowments, I guess, or? Uh, there's no art school with a huge endowment. Um, Rhode, Rhode Island's is decent. Uh, well, maybe maybe Cal Arts or a couple of the California colleges might have much better. I want to be but, careful about that, yeah. but yeah. Yeah, I'll be. I'll be I careful. know what you're saying. Just yeah, the, those um, art schools. <laughs> not, not real high. Um, they don't have the business magnets uh, that that were alumni uh, the yeah, delivering like, in the companies delivering money to them. They don't have the AI investment. Right. That, that's college for, College for Creative Studies. Um, again, I, I should say this: some of my closest friends and very good artists that teach at Ringling, they give great information. If you got the money, great experience. Uh, and um, College for Creative Studies. Um, the school is in Detroit. It's not on the beach in Florida. Um, for my money, it's it has the best illustration program and games games art. Uh, program in the country right now they're exceptional for, a, for an in-person college for an in-person college they're they're superb um they're also a lot less expensive um this is and you can see their this is their portfolio requirements starts with the five drawings from observation additional pieces can submit of any of genre i mean it could be any art genre, which could be sculpture, which could be um, painting, which could be photography, um, and and then it, then what it's not, and then things that it's not limited to down below. But it's fairly specific. Show your strongest skills and work. Very important. If you're interested in going to these schools, follow them to the T. Show them exactly what they're looking for. And then there's some suggestions I make about showing them more. Show them that you understand process a little bit. Show them that you carry a sketchbook. Show them that they're doing that 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 you're ahead of the game, and you have an understanding of where you're, you know, of of of, of what you're going to be uh, embracing when you get to school. Um, I uh, this is their entertainment arts. It's very specific. Again, you can research these for any school that you're interested in too. Uh, going to. This is where the reduced tuitions come from. This is where scholarships come from, is the quality of the portfolio. Get it right. Put your efforts into this. It's going to make a difference for you. I mean, they're, they're, um, I, I should have mentioned their, I mean, their um, application and um, enroll, uh, um, acceptance rate, you know, for art schools, it's like 70 plus percent. They accept a lot of people. Oh. It can probably be probably higher than the rest of the higher ed. Yeah, very much so. Um, there's a few, though, um, that are more difficult. Um, Somebody asked, John, um, what was the, I'm assuming you were talking about uh, for game arts. What was the school you had said had a great game arts program? Well, this this one right now. College for I, Creative Studies. Yeah. College for Creative Studies has a great game, game arts program. Uh, the most famed game arts program a decade ago was Art Center. And it was built by Tim Flaherty. Timmy and I met Tim Flaherty at Ringling, at um, College for Creative Studies. Detroit. He is from Detroit. He moved to Detroit and he built their new game arts program. And it's really good. Um, if you're interested in going into that, it's, it's, it's a good program. Um, so notice the price difference. Still, it's one hundred sixty thousand dollars to get, uh, education um, with the discounts. It's still expensive, um, but if you're one of those students where you can get a scholarship, more power to you. 
Um, and that can, I mean, this is an average. It's not, this is not what everybody pays. This is an average. And that means there's some that are paying the full price and some that are paying a much lower price. There's some that are going there for free. Um, and it's all, it's all baked into, the, to, into those numbers. But those scholarships and reduced tuition come from the quality of the, of the portfolio. Okay, I've said enough about that. You can go to any college that you're interested in and figure that out and then produce, make your portfolio built around their requirements. And John, a, more than one person has asked specifically about like, what, what do you think about this school or that school? And I'm hesitant to get into a rating system of like what schools. I talk about those two schools because yeah. I know them very well. And, yeah. and I've worked with their, uh, well, at the College for Creative Studies, their chair of their illustration program was a past student of mine, teaches with us or does things with us a lot. A couple of their faculty are, are from our program. I know them well. Ringling, same thing. If and, you're trying to vet a school that, um, a school not mentioned here, right? And you were, you were a student trying to figure out, is this the right school for me? What are questions you would ask like an admissions officer, you think? Okay. Um, ask that, well, I, okay. I'm not gonna do it because it'll take too much time, but I would ask the person, what part of the industry you wanna go to work in? Okay. okay, assuming they said illustration, okay, okay, who are the illustrators that came from your program? Yeah, and I'm assuming if you talk with the admissions, you know, uh, somebody in admissions or somebody in recruitment of that school, I'm assuming that they should have they should have a list prepared. Right, that. and you can see some of those on their website. Yeah, um, and they they show off some of their stars. It was funny that um, both of those schools. I only knew one person that they were talking about. I was like, I don't know any of these people. <laughs> so yeah, one of them. Um, <laughs> You go to Cal Arts, you see Tim Burton. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, there you go. Um, so anyway, um, um, if you have if you have questions, reach out to me. I'd be happy to you know talk to you about what you're doing, you what you're you know what's in your what you want to do in your portfolio, and I, I would be more comfortable in doing that not in a, a public place. Um, okay, um, this skillcraft ideation and industry. Most schools teach skill and craft. Very few focus on ideation like they should. And I think it goes like, okay, they put all their interest over here on the left-hand side. They put a little bit more interest in the ideation and they put almost zero on the right-hand side. To be successful in this industry, you have to treat all three of these with the same importance. I don't care how well you draw and paint. If you don't understand the industry, you're not going to work in the industry. I don't care if how well you draw and paint. If you can't solve problems, come up with concepts or visually tell a story, under, uh, create, um, a create, your, create a narrative, you're not going to work in the industry. You have to have all three of these things. It's the three things that we've developed in our program that we pull information from, from every one of our classes. They're all trying to satisfy these three major topics. I think it's really important. I put this thing together years ago and I pulled it out today because I thought it would be fun. It's still, it's still, per I put it together like six years ago and it's still very, um, it's appropriate for this talk. It's the, the skill sets for different parts of the industry. So an illustration, these, these editorial book, advertising, institutional, and sequential, those are the five major groupings of the illustration world. Now there's illustration and, and there's a huge confusion. Well, John Nymeister and I had that conversation this morning, Timmy, about the number of students that think that Tyler Jacobson and Chris Ron, that they're concept artists. Well, kind of, they do concept, they do illustration for the concept world. Right. And, and, and a lot of keyframe is that, a lot of splash work is that. John Nymeister is more of an illustrator, understands all kinds of great, you know, concept art uh, um, pipeline, and he has skills as a concept artist. But what he does, what people know him for, is these beautiful images he, that he does. That's really illustration work. And so I break up the. This is how the industry looks at the illustration world. These five major categories. Do you think we can send this to people after this? No, totally fine. 
Yeah, I'll be sure to send this if it if it's a little too small for some of you. And and again, yeah. it's this is this is big picture. It is also there's exceptions to everything. Um, you know, there's concept artists that do this. There's illustrators that that understand other technical skills. There's there's back and forth. Now, since I did this, you know, when I first put this together, all illustrators have some understanding of technology. Um, you have to. I mean, even if it's uh, scanning your work or photographing your work and sending it to the art director digitally. Um, nobody's accepting it. The standard practice is it's in digital form when it arrives to the publisher. Um, that's the bare minimum. Um, and so they learn, you learn how to use Photoshop, correct color and, and crop and, and clean your work up to send it to the art director. That's the bare minimum. But almost everybody, even as archaic as I am, and much of a, as much of a Luddite as I am, I, I use Photoshop. I use Photoshop to do, um, uh, uh, for my reference, I change my reference in Photoshop. I color correct images. I clean up images. And I, more, more thing I do at the most is I do paint overs for students with Photoshop. You got to know it. Um, you got to have some understanding. You got to live in this world. Let's put it that way. Um, the industry expects that. Um, the having observational drawing, as I said, it all starts with drawing. That's what, you know, painting is drawing. If you're going to be a digital painter, you got to be able to draw. Um, if, you know, we talked about, uh, with Omar and talking in a 3d talk last couple of weeks ago, uh, he talked about, I had to learn how to draw. He's a 3d modeler, but he practices drawing. Um, it's part of it. Um, could I backpedal just a little bit for some sure. of the, um, maybe newer artists in the audience? Could you just like, very, just like the, the simplest rundown of composition and ideation, maybe start with composition and- I'm, I'm going to. Um, oh, I'm sorry. It, it, sorry. It, I, get, I get into it. I get into all of this stuff deeper. Great. This is just is like the beginnings of it. Um, observational drawing. I'm going to show examples of it. I'm going to show, I'll show just a quick couple examples of constructive anatomy. Composition um, is accepting, and I'll talk more about it, is accepting that the picture, a picture itself is a collection of shapes. And you have to learn how to compose the shapes on a page so they're, so they're saying and doing what you want them to do. That's your job as a composer. Um, ideation is a mechanism to create idea, to, to um, create ideas, to problem solve. Uh, it's a way to manufacture solutions. Uh, either in concept or, or storytelling. I'll show you how that works in a little bit. Um, and then, you know, storytelling is the same way. Uh, the technical skills, you notice I've weighted all the technical skills on entertainment, visual development. Visual development originally was a term for designing animation. And it's character design, it's creature design, it's environment design. And it, visual development just used to be animation, but now it's the whole entertainment world. Um, Andy Parks is a head of visual development for Marvel Studios, and in its and it's a lot of the character design, it's a lot of the um, uh, scene design, and it it covers a lot more ground than it used to, but it is the it it is the design of things, and and it's the things that are going to be made. So, like here's a perfect example of visual. There's a lot of visual development artists that are there that that work in the animation world, and they come from the children's book industry. Some of the best: uh, Peter DeSev, Claire Wendling, Carter Goodrich, and they do beautiful character design. Uh, they do character like Peter DeSev designed Ice Age characters for Pixar, but. He started out as an editorial illustrator. He's done he's done 50 New York plus 50 plus New Yorker covers, but he's got a plethora of books out too. That's where the animation industry comes. He has to do everything. He does the drawing, he does the character design, he does the storytelling. As a book artist, you do everything. As a visual development artist, you design them, somebody else makes them. As a concept artist, you're designing something that somebody else is gonna go down the pipeline and somebody else is gonna polish it and finish it. And um, you, you, so learning pipeline, learning the flow is extremely important and knowing where you wanna fit into it. Um, I always tell people that um, 
think about a studio that produces animation or or game the most important asset that that studio owns is the story itself um the story is the most important thing as a as a visual artist the closer you are to telling the story or designing the story the more value you have and the further away from production you are the farther down the chain you are as production and there's nothing wrong with production um it's just production is a little bit more difficult because it's outsourced a lot. People get finished with a, 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 um, an IP gets produced and shipped. And the first people that go are the production artists. Um, the people, the, the, the thinkers, the, the, the creative people, they're there to do the next piece and uh, to, to tell the next story. So the closer you are to that story in designing it or telling it, I believe the most val value you have. Storyboard artists have phenomenal value in this industry. Uh, character designers, creature designers, environment designers. Um, they have a lot of value. All right, I'm going to keep going here. Um, anyway, this is, again, this is just an idea of the skills that you need to work in. And when I get down to technical skills, that could be understanding ZBrush or Blender or use of Photoshop, or it, it could be a number of different things, depending on what part of the industry you're working in and, and what, the, what, the, what part of the pipeline you're working on. Um, same is true with digital skills. Um, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the next slide. I got to keep moving here. Uh, these are the skills that I think that you have to focus on. And, it's the th and starting with drawing, these are the things that those schools are going to want to see. And these are the things that are going to make you a better artist. You can treated either, either way. Um, I'm gonna kind of walk through and show you different industry drawing, observational from life. And that's how most people learn how to draw. You look at something and you draw it, you practice that. Now there's different techniques. I mean, there's the barge system, there's sight size, there's, <laughs> as George, uh, George Pratt and I joke about a lot, there's the looking at it and drawing it. <laughs> That's that's how I learned how to draw, and uh, I also took uh, I also took some classes and learned how to draw by sight size with unit of measure. You see artists doing this; they're measuring with the tip of their pencil and they're finding a user to measure, and it's building your drawing from that. Um, there's also constructive anatomy, which I'll show you a slide of it later on, which is basically applying a, um, a geometric shape to body major body parts or to all body parts where if you practice it long enough it's very good for being able to develop a character or a creature from memory you don't need reference um you can you and again it's not going to have like it's not something that's going to have maybe as much personality to it um at the beginning but if you get really skilled at it and some of somebody like wesley birth that has done a lot of lectures with us and taught with us at the Illustration Academy. He understands, and he's one of the premier character designers in the industry. He understands constructive anatomy really well. And he'll sit down and he'll do a figure, um, develop a, a figure and environment, and he won't be looking at any reference. He just does it from memory. Um, it's, a, it's a fantastic tool for that part of the industry. It doesn't work as well on the illustration side because it doesn't have the mood and emotion, the emotional qualities that you can achieve with by, by being able to stretch and bring in characterization and mood and uh, to the to the to the subjects. So observational drawing kind of rules on that side. Um, learning how to draw from life is great. You know, carry a sketchbook, go to life drawing classes. Uh, Learning how to draw from photo reference is a necessity. Everybody in the industry, even Wesley Burt, uses photo reference at time. And drawing from reference is the standard in the industry. Creating your own reference, which requires you have to understand lighting and posing, um, very, very important. Drawing from memory, like not looking at anything and not knowing constructive anatomy, is, is also very helpful too. It's when you're the most creative. And when you can use yourself as a personal library, 
um, you're not influenced by anything that you're looking at. And you'll do very creative things drawing from memory. A lot of thumbnailing is done from memory. And I'll explain what that is in just a second. Uh, process. <clears throat> Our industry is a process industry. Um, I know most of the, the, the painters that I know that sell artwork for a living in galleries, they're process artists. They do thumbnails. They do finished pieces from their thumbnails. They shoot photo reference and they use that to, to inform their paintings. There's a process that they have of putting a picture together. This process is the process of the illustration world. Also, if you ask John Nymeister, who does a lot of splash work, he goes, this is the same process, very sim similar of what I go through with my team at high res, uh, except it's not just with the art director, it's with a whole team of people. You have modelers there, you have marketing people there, you have skinners there and riggers there, and all, all the people that are a part of the pipeline, they all have a say in the picture that you're making. You do not make these pictures on an island. You're solving somebody else's problem or coming up with a solution for something that is a need for that part of the industry. And so you use ideation. Think of it this way as I have to come up with an idea. And so we teach a technique where you start with word stacks and several techniques, but that's the main point. I'll show you. I think I got a picture of it here. Um, Here's, this is what an ideation search looks like. As you're reading a, a, a character brief or a, 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 an article for a magazine or a book, whatever you get from the art director to learn about the subject, you make this list of, of words that are important, the things that you thought were most important about the subject you were just reading about. Get done with whatever you're reading, brief, article, book, whatever, and then go back and focus on your list and you try to apply a visual. What is the most iconic visual that best explains that word? That is, that is getting from text to visual. Those visuals are saying the same as those words there. You've given them a visual, an iconic visual that mean the same thing. Those visuals that you come up with will start to become the objects of your illustration or piece of concept work that you're doing. It's, it's a great way to manufacture solutions. You know, you're not sitting around waiting, what's the best thing that can happen? Is you're chasing an idea. Timmy, you're muted. Sorry, sorry. That, that's been asked two times I can do that in a meeting. Okay. Uh, this really, this ideation really made sense to me when I finally, when I saw Sterling give his studio bridge talk, where he was tasked with doing a cover for um, the Jungle Book and talk about a story that has been done so many times. I mean, uh, the visual narrative that is is wrapped into the jungle. I mean, it's I can't even imagine how many, how much competition he has to come up with an original idea around that. And he of course came up with this genius concept. And if you just saw the finished product, you'd be like, wow, he's could, Sterling's an alien. How did he do this? He's so smart. Like he's a genius. And mm -hmm. he had a very technical process not that he's not a genius but he had a very technical process that was like well the, he followed these this this method and it got him there and it didn't seem as uh it demystified it yeah i mean we have a um catherine lamb did a like an intro to ideation we have a class specifically that's called ideation and visual storytelling catherine teaches the class before process skill and craft uh, which is learning learning how to make a picture like this and getting comfortable with that process. This is the beginnings of it. So she did a little demo and has it posted on our posted in our uh, discord channel. I've watched that thing like 30 times and I just can't believe how easily she moves through it. It's amazing what happens. Um, anyway, um, this is one of several techniques that, that if you could show that you can think visually like this in a portfolio, you're going to be put in another, another category. <laughs> you're going to be put at the top of the food chain because this is, um, this is something that's very advanced as a picture maker. 
And if you were showing that you were using a process that, that, that in your portfolio, in your sketchbook that you're doing this, schools are going to go nuts. They're going to love it. And, and John, question. It, as an outsider myself, and then as somebody else who's watching, this isn't just a madman scribbling and drawing in a notebook. This is, this is a really technical process that. Absolutely. Yeah. It, they're on a chase. Um, and yeah, but it, I mean, it's, an idea. Idea. it's hot. I mean, like, it's not just like scribble down notes. These aren't just like random notes next to, you know, scribbles, right? Absolutely. No, not at all. Not at all. And it, it, if you, if you, I mean, this comes from the interpretation of, a story or a brief. Um, if you go and you look in our, we use Discord, all of our classes have Discord. That's how we communicate student to instructor every day. And if you you could see every student, it all looks, it, unless you got into detail, it would all look the same <laughs> at the beginning. They're all doing this wild, it just looks like yeah. chaos, but it's actually very controlled. Um, this is the power of the three value thumbnail. This is the next step. So you come up with an idea. This is all to make one picture. This is this the, this process is not just a process for you being a better picture maker. It's also the 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 communication of the art director that you're working with or the committee that you're working with. Um, this is how you visually communicate with your art director. Now this is overkill. A professional might turn in three or four examples of a way to to solve one problem. This is these 10 examples are for one picture that they're going to make. It's not about polish and finish. This was all drawn from memory. And, but it gives a blueprint and a whole group of different ways of seeing one solution, one, one picture, many different outcomes. And it gives the it gives the art director an opportunity to choose the, the one they want to go forward with. This is the same thing. These are beyond thumbnails. These are value studies. Um, these are um, very complete, the, the drawing, the design. But this is a final drawing and a value study. These are color studies for that final drawing. This is the finish. Um, this is process. The industry demands it. You know, as an as a editorial illustrator, which I did a lot of magazine work, I also did a lot of book work. Um, and as a magazine uh, uh, illustrator, I did a thumbnail, several thumbnails. I would, I did maybe do 50 or 60 of them and submit my three favorite. The art director would choose one and I would go from thumbnail to finished illustration. No color, no final drawing because the timeline was so fast. Um, in the advertising world, in the book world, you're gonna have to do a finished drawing. You're gonna have to do something in between. If you're doing advertising work, they're going to probably ask you to do a color study. Um, they want to know if you're doing movie work, you might do 20 color studies. I mean, you're, you're going to do a lot of work in between before you get to do the final. But it's all approval basis. The art director and the editor are going to approve each step of the way. you got to learn to work in the process that the industry runs in. If you can show process in your portfolio to the, to, to the school that you're applying, Trust me, they're gonna they're gonna love it. On the other side, on the concept side, this is process. This is this is these are iterations of, of, of thumbnails for a character design. You can even see their influence of the refer of visuals. And, and the first thing a character a character designer will do is they'll create a reference board or a mood board, and it'll be um, visual language that they want to bring into their character. Almost everything starts with flat silhouette, shape design. These are superb. These are really high level. Do you have the name of who that, is that Teresa, Teresa or is it? I don't know if this was Teresa's or not. I don't know if it, I think it's, it might be Josh Ware's, but I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 All I, right. Yeah. This is definitely Josh Ware. And so it would go from that flat silhouette. It would probably go to line and value. And then it's going to go to color. I don't know if I, here's a, here's a really fleshed out. This is a really professional piece. It's got the orthographic. It's got the turnarounds. Remember, this is pipeline. Very little concept work. This is actually very finished for for concept work. Most good concept work. I'm going to skip forward. This is perfect. This this shows you exactly 
how a modeler could go take it to the next step. Omar reviewed this last week and he was like, this is exactly what I need. I need side view, front view, back view. So I know how everything's made. I know what's in front of things. Things are articulated well. I could model this without an issue. Most concept work never goes to finish. And it's all about chasing design and idea. And uh, Lake Hurwitz, who teaches on our program, he calls it concept brain. This, and he is always saying, nope, you're fit doing too much finish. That's not needed. You're wasting time. Show me another version of it is what I want to see. I want to see more designs and less finish. Mm-hmm. And so, again, this is, this is everything that you need to deliver. This is very professional work. Here's color studies for, you know, uh, what give the give the art director options on color study. Mm. Okay. My f- these three major drawing exercises are things you should be practicing to develop your drawing. Life drawing. Start with that. Draw your drink sketchbook and three value thumbnails. Life drawing. This is how I teach figure drawing. This is a demo I did at the academy. This is another one. This is just a drawing I did. Here's a drawing. This is I learned this process from my father. We teach it a little bit differently. We teach it, see the whole figure at once and shape, but it's drawing from the figure. The thing about drawing from life is that you get more information. You can look around things. You can see how things are made and constructed. Uh, Photograph flattens it out. Um, Again, in the industry, you draw from photography all the time. If you know how to draw the model, learning how to draw from photo reference, you can fill in the blanks. There's not as much information in the photography. You can't look around it. You can't see see everything. And um, if if you practice drawing from life, it's easier for you to fill in the blanks. It makes you a better drawer. These are all from faculty from the academy. This is is a 15-minute drawing from my father. It's also 30 inches tall. He was a beastly drawer. George Pratt, Sterling Hunley. Again, they don't, you can bring as much polish and finish or make them very expressive. It's observational drawing. C.F. Payne, Bill Sienkiewicz, Gary Kelly, John Foster, John Foster again. This is the most perfect example, shape design for drawing. When you squint at that image, as delicate as it gets, you see the silhouette. It's a shape first. And he did this as a, as a demonstration for the students and then said, look how little information, as long as the silhouette explains itself, how little information I need to make it look finished. Very smart. Draw your drink. This was a uh, kind of a joke that we did at the academy. It was a, it was a tr- to trick the students in, make them every time of day, whether breakfast, lunch, or dinner, to draw whatever they were drinking before they drank it. So glass of water, glass of orange juice, glass of milk, beer, whatever it is, draw it first. And what it did was get them in that, get them in the habit of carrying their sketchbook with them all the time. Really smart. That was Brent Watkinson's idea. He said, eventually they're going to draw their drink and then they're going to start drawing everything around them. And that's what happened. And that's, it's a great exercise. It will make you, if you do this for 30 days, your drawing skills will get so much better. Uh, And you got to do it five times a day, but your drawing skills will get tremendously, a tremendous jump in growth. And so carrying a sketchbook, this is, uh, this is out of George Pratt's sketchbook. Wherever he is, this, I don't know who, if that's George, that's um, Doug Jacob drawing. Mm -hmm. This is George drawing. Again, some of these are from, uh, this is actually George drawing from photographs in a sketchbook. This is Wesley Burt drawing out of his sketchbook. Now, I'm gonna hurt you a little bit. Almost all of these figures were drawn from memory. That's a really good drawer. Somebody that, that has learned constructive anatomy and he, and that's why he is like the premier character designer in the world. There's not many people that can do that. But think of the advantage that he has. He can move fast. These were definitely done from memory. 
Pretty amazing. George Pat, more George. These are just random. Uh, well, this is a- um, That was Bill, was that Bill Carmen before? This, I think it, maybe it was. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not sure, I'm really not. I, um, Sorry. That's okay. This is um, Natalie Hall. And Natalie was very much involved uh, with Guillermo de Torres, uh, The Shape of Water. She did the artwork that was in the movie. Um, and fabulous artist. And this is direct, shot directly out of the moleskin. You can see the, you know, these are in her sketchbook. Thumbnails. This is Edward Kinsella, past student of ours, instructor of ours, and just award-winning illustrator. He's just an exceptional talent. These are all his value studies from the previous couple of years of assignments that he's worked on. And he's taught, he's at the academy showing off, this is what I do before I do the finish. And he would do a very rough thumbnail and do a very finished value study, a finished drawing, and then do the finish. And that was his process that he would show as art directors all the time. Little notes from Edward. I love these things about what a thumbnail should be. Um, rough ideas. Yeah, I'll read this part. This is even better. Uh, how to get better thumbnails. Start with value shapes only. General to the specific. Hold off on too much detail. Save it for final. Simplify, simplify, simplify. Don't try to make a great drawing. Think of it as a, a blueprint or a roadmap. That's the, the perfect explanation of a thumbnail. It's there, it's where idea and design first come together. It's the first part of a visual. It's when your time is the least expensive as an artist and you can try many of these. It's the beginning part of process as a picture maker. And you use them as blueprints. Here is an, this is right out of Sterling Hunley's um, sketchbook. He made a finished illustration out of this piece. This is him chasing. This is when uh, what a sketchbook should look like to me. It's some observational drawing where he's trying to figure out character, but not until he puts a box around something does it become a, a composition. This is thinking about division of space, light and dark pattern. And it's in it and, and, and composition is a journey. And that's why this process is so important. More of Sterling. The three value thumbnail. This is a practice. This is an exercise I give my students all the time. Practice. This is this is one of the most famed illustrators. He's called the father of American illustration. It's Howard Pyle. This is what a three value thumbnail looks like of that of that illustration. It took the student. 10 minutes to do this. And what did they learn from that? They learned a huge amount about composition, how this was organized with value. And it's like a push up and sit up. It's just as important as drawing. It's helping you with your compositional skills. It's something that everybody should be doing all the time to, to learn more about composition. Mm -hmm. Other examples, uh, this is somebody, a student doing a, that's one of my father's paintings. That's, um, uh, a Harvey Dunn, that's another Howard Pyle. Uh, here's a photograph, this is an inspiration. This is my ideation of going out and doing research to make a painting. This was a, the, I did all of this at the Academy a few years ago. I did the thumbnail and the finished painting in front of the students. So this is the end, end thumbnail that I created. I'm taking out, I'm focusing, it's different than the, than the photograph. I thought the trees were the most interesting part and I wanna do a design that's wrapped around that. That was my final painting, not my great best painting, but it you can see I'm using the inspiration of what I was looking at in my reference and I'm designing it further to fit my needs. These are more thumbnails. You got a wow. You got a wow from somebody with the painting, John, so. Cool. <laughs> um, yeah. Always looking for a wow. Um, <laughs> this was actually a demo I did for illustration isolation, the very first illustration isolation talk we ever did. Yeah. Uh, here's an example of some of my father's thumbnails and crude as can be. He's not looking at anything. He's just drawing. Here's that little drawing and here's this little painting that he did right next to it. It's that direct. 
examples of some of his thumbnails for, you know, this is what a thumbnail looked like for some of these really large scale abstracted landscapes he did. And he would, he would always say, he's like, if I solve it two inches square and I stay true to that, I know it's going to work at four foot square. And so why would I, once I get into paint and materials and color medium, why would I want to change anything if I've already made it work two inches square? And so he, he it looked like he was rendering his thumbnail, like he was looking at a photograph for information. So these became this. And then here's, you know, here's one of Sterling's, another of Sterling's, George Pratt, the great Bernie Fuchs. There's a, a, a thumbnail he did for Sports Illustrated. This is a thumbnail for a painting that uh, Wesley Burke did. And then just examples of different students in our program using the thumbnail, the power of the three value thumbnail. Constructive anatomy looks like this. As I said, you, 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 this is a, it's gonna take you a little while to learn how to do this. It's a lot of practice. I don't like, it's not gonna work for me because it's not the type of drawing that it produces. This is somebody that uses this constructive anatomy and observational. He uses both. This is the great Steve Houston, really good artist. Good drawer. I know I, it, this drawing's great. I love it. I know George Pratt, without constructive anatomy, can do, do, do something that's just as effective. I know that Chris Payne can draw. Um, and get the same emotional and, and, and maybe even more emotional content. This is, this is really an academic approach. Very few academic, it's really hard to get beyond the academic approach. That's why I don't push it very hard in the, in the illustration side. So additional skills that you really need to garner and learn. Effective lighting, simple color, basic perspective, creating reference. Timmy, we'll finish up here in just a few minutes. I'm, I'm oh, gonna- This is great. Do I look like I'm like, <laughs> so I'm going uh, no, <laughs> to, no. yeah, Tim, Timmy's ordering food right now. Yeah, um, yeah my Uber Eats. <laughs> so illustration for beginners. This is a class. Uh, it was called Foundations for a few semesters. This is a class that was designed for the purpose of people developing those college portfolios. And for our students that are try that want to go to our program that are, that aren't completely equipped to start with Catherine Ram, Lamb in our first level illustration class. Um, and so people that just want to have an edge before they start our program. And um, many of our students that have gone through the whole program have gone through this, gone through this class. Is this a good class? Like when, it, I know it's called illustration for beginners, but like a true beginner. Yeah, very much so. Um, it's going to teach you, uh, there's, there's people that come into this class that have quite a bit of drawing skill. There's people that have none. Um, we, I, I've had three different writers, authors take this class for the purpose they, they approached me and said, I, I've always wanted to, I want to try illustrating the books that I've written, but I'm not an artist. Where would I start? Yeah. And you know, a couple of them. Um, yeah. Um, a couple of them have turned out really amazing. Um, so how to create from reference. This is one of my favorite artists. And I show a lot of his work at the beginning. This is uh, Nikolai Fetchin. I show Nikolai Fetchin, Albright Durr, and Hans Holbein as three artists that influenced each other. Photo reference. You might think he drew that from life but he didn't. <laughs> he drew it from that piece of reference. I can prove it. <laughs> I've seen it at the Fetchin Museum. Um, so learning how to do that and wow. create that reference and posing is the first part of creating the drawing. And understanding effective lighting serves you as a concept artist. It serves you as an illustrator. It serves you as a, I mean, Timmy knows a lot more about lighting than I do. Um, I know lighting for the purposes that I need. Timmy's a photographer, videographer. Um, light and form, effective lighting, shadow, posing, rendering. This is, an, this is effective lighting. This is, there are lighting scenarios that work well, that artists have used throughout history that we teach. This right here is called short loop lighting, that loop underneath the nose. That's why it's called short loop lighting. This is called Rembrandt lighting. 
you can guess where that came from. That's the lighting scenario that Rembrandt used all the time. It was labeled it as him. This is bar lighting, top lit, cast, fills the shadows of the eyes. This is butterfly lighting, that little shape of the butterfly of that cast shadow underneath the nose. This short loop and Rembrandt are very, very similar. You're all familiar with horror lighting. Mood and emotion that comes from lighting. And it also gives you, it's describing the form. It makes it easy to draw from, it gives you information to draw from. John, I'm imagining if you were a, if you were to be putting together a portfolio for an art school and submit work that has like this level of lighting or thought into it, I mean, does that? Well, if you could show that, that you pretty... huge. If you could show that, okay, I created this photo reference to do this drawing and you did a good drawing from that and they could see where that information come from. That huge, it's gonna make a huge difference. It's gonna show, you know, this is my best buddy here, George Pratt uh, the, at the Illustration Academy. This is a student and what are they doing? They're using a single light source to shoot a figure. Same thing that's going on here. This is creating photo reference. This is called a form, forms principle. This is how light affects form based around a sphere. This is all you need to know about rendering, how to polish something. You got to know what a cast shadow is. You got to know what the core shadow is. You got to know what the midtones and the ref what is reflected light and highlight. This is a Nikolai Fetch and drawing. There's the cast shadow. The nose is in the way of the light and it's cast on the surface of the face. This is a cast shadow. This is the core shadow. He's using all of this information to do his drawing. And so I like to teach those two things together to give you the, the, the really basic principles of understanding how to render. When you, when you, and, and then this is a John Foster illustration. This is how he shot the illustration. This is the, how he posed the model and shot the model, the lighting scenario. That's what he did to create that reference so he could do this piece of work. Additional skills, simple color, basic perspective. Simple color, learning just how mathematically a color wheel works. And then learning the most basic parts of using color, the difference of temperature, what's warm, what's cool. As a painter and an illustrator, understanding temperature is much more important to know this is a very cool temperature painting. It's full color. It has the primaries, blue, obviously, but there's an indication of red and yellow. That makes it full color. That color is very relative. And so without the yellow or out the red, it's a, two, a one or two color image. And it, it's not making a complete, um, a, a full color image. This is a very warm picture. By the way, these are Robert Heindel, one of my favorite artists. I love this guy's work. Um, but here's a very warm picture, warm in temperature. It's got red, it's got yellow, and then it's got a little bit of blue. It's so warm, it needs hardly any blue because it's relative, but it makes it full color. Without the blue or without the yellow, it's just a two color piece. And so it's it, it you can learn and it's much easier this is like using the rule of dominance for color, designing color. It's much easier to make a painting that leans heavy, heavily towards the warm or cool side. If it starts to become 50-50, it's hard. Battles happen and color can destroy your piece very quickly. So I, my suggestions are learning and, 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 and you can show that you understand this stuff. Uh, a couple of great palettes for warm and cool. This is all delivered in this class and how we laid it out. Well, I, th I, I thought I was at my next slide, sorry. We talk about basic perspective, one point. There's a one point perspective box. Two, one vanishing, um, this has now has two vanishing points and a horizon line. That's what two point perspective looks like. We talk a little bit more about it in the class, but it's really the basics of understanding one, two and three point perspective and how to move it around and how to control it. This is also atmospheric perspective. This is one of my paintings. 
how warm it is, what the temperature's like in the beginning. At the front of the painting, as distance, there's more air molecules in between. Things get very, the, the temperature comes, becomes cooler, and that's atmospheric perspective. This has it in it also, but it also has overlap. The best form of perspective is putting something in front of something, um, and, yeah. and, and, and you, can't, you can't go wrong. Uh, illustrators, concept artists learn how to cheat perspective. Um, your perspective does not have to be perfect all the time, but you can cheat it. The easiest way to cheat it is don't show anybody's feet hitting the ground <laughs> and put something, always put, be putting something in front of something. And it makes perspective very uh, easy to use. Um, these are the four assignments I give in this class. Create a portrait of an individual from photography. I'm gonna teach you the lighting. I'm gonna teach you how to shoot the photography how to use your phone to shoot the photography using these two lighting sources. And that's the first thing is the photography aspect. And then you're gonna do a drawing. You're gonna use these materials, just graphite and charcoal. You could use all graphite or all charcoal or a combination. These are the substrates I want you to work on. These are two that work well, you can use others. Recognize this, Timmy? This is a portrait of, Tim, uh, of Timmy's father. I ended up using this as an example. I did another one. As John, a, this is like our only collaboration. That's right. Currently. That's my photo. Timmy right? shot the photo. I did the drawing. <laughs> but I did it as a demo for it started as a demo for the class. This is my thumbnail. I even do thumbnails for the drawing itself because I want to design my drawing. I want it, I want this what ed, what edges are going to be lost, where my where my textures in the background are going to be. So I did took the time to do a, a couple of thumbnails and thought, okay, I like this design and I applied it to the finished drawing. This is, these are demos. I always do the assignments with my students. I did this last semester, Jim Thorpe. Obviously I didn't shoot the photograph. I'm old, but I'm not that old. Um, I used a piece of found reference, which was a single light source that had short loop light. There's, there's that loop. And I did this drawing in front of the students. The second assignment is a figure drawing assignment, and you're learning how to use pastels in this. So it's for, a anyone, for anyone wondering, I, I dropped a link to this class in the chat. Um, it is enrolling right now. Um, obviously, that's why we are talking about it. Uh, and if you are considering art schools, um, I know we're flying through a lot of this information, but that it's a, it's a hit the ground running course. Well, about half of the students that take this course each semester take it for the purpose of developing, especially in the summertime, they take it for the purpose of developing a portfolio to submit to art schools. And showing, showing the things that I show are very, they connect to those requirements from the art schools. They're very common. And so the next one is, is teaching a figure drawing. I, 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 teach students how to use, and I demonstrate how to use new pastels on mid-tone paper. Here's the paper sample. This is my drawing process. I do these in front of the students in class. They have recordings of it. They can see it, watch it over and over again. All the steps are written out in a PDF. They can, and we talk through it. My first step is I either draw light or dark first. This time I chose, this is gonna be a light figure with a darker background. So I started with the light, just one pastel. And the second step, I put a dark around it. I did put a little bit of cool in the cool shadow. And then I take my hand and I obliterate it. I rub them together. And then I went back and I reinstate the darks and lights and get a very finished look quickly. These are maximum 30 minute drawings. And they're big, they're on 30 inch pieces of paper. Um, so, it's, it's how I was taught to draw the figure. It's how my dad taught figure drawing, and it's how I learned how to draw the figure. And I think it makes a sense, a, a lot of sense as a picture maker. Developing in line, and you can, and I use line in places in all my drawings, but developing in line, line does not explain shape as well as value does. So if you get the, if you get the silhouette and you squint at this piece or squint at this piece, this was another one I did for class, it's a light figure against the dark background. You see the silhouette first. A picture is a collection of shapes. You're using the figure as a shape. You're using value to control to define your shapes. It all plays and it all works together. 
you're practicing, you're getting better at drawing, you're getting better at designing, and you're lear learning about shape design. Here's another one I did in class. I did this also as a clothed figure, uh, learning just basic principles of drawing fabric, hard edge, soft edge, what, you know, what, what, what creates, and this is all about form shadows and cast shadows. And this was my little painting I did um, as an example of, uh, uh, it's pastel, but it's an example of a clothed figure. And then the last assignments, the three and four, it's a five week class. So the, the third week, you're gonna focus on making a picture. You're gonna be doing thumbnails. And it's gonna be of a landscape. It's going to be of a landscape that you photograph, and it's going to be reinterpreting the landscape, just like I showed you in my thumbnails. And so this is an example. This is a photograph I shot up in the national parks. I was actually driving from Wyoming to North uh, Dakota, and I, I shot this out of my car window and with my iPhone, and it's very panoramic. And I shot a whole bunch of shots like this. And I came back and I, I started focusing on, I'm going to design this. And so I put it into Photoshop. And you can see from the reference how much of it I changed. You know, there was trees behind these trees. I made it my design. I rechanged the background. I, I changed the, the horizon line in the background. And then I once I did that, I redrew it. And I even changed it even more in my thumbnails. And then you saw the painting, uh, the finished painting. I'll show it to you again in a second. But in the, and then, and then the last class is you take your, your best finished design and you make a painting out of it. And I demonstrate how to use a mixed media painting, how to start with acrylics, or you can finish in acrylics too. But we use acrylics and then we go to diff two different versions of oil. And I showed two different, I showed different approaches. This is wet into wet oil that I did from that thumbnail design. This is very dry oil on top of an acrylic, flat acrylic shape that I used oil crayons and dry, dry brush oil paint to make this picture. And so these are all demos out of the class. Starts June 5th. It's called Illustration for Beginners. I'm sure Timmy sent you the link. Um, if, you, if, if I never have a conversation with you again, <laughs> um, pay attention to what, what Timmy and I were talking about as far as thinking about developing for schools. Your best, your, a portfolio is the thing that's going to help you not just get into the school, but it's going to control your, your uh, tuition. And that's where scholarships and reduced tuition come from. Uh, they're looking for good students. Um, the, um, the portfolio, just being a better artist, these are the basic things you need to understand that you're gonna work on for years. These are the basic information. Um, I, have a, I have a drawing from last Thursday night, you know, from, from illustration isolation. I draw two times every Thursday. I practice drawing. I've been drawing for 50 plus years of my, well, no, 40, 46 years I've been drawing. And I practice drawing six or eight hours a week. Um, I'm okay at it. I do, I, I know how to draw pretty well, but I get better at it and I keep practicing it. Chris Payne comes and draws with us. He's the, one of the best drawers on the planet. He practices his drawing daily. These are basic things you do to better yourself as an artist. And I like to think that this illustration for beginners is my perspective. And it really is, when I say my, it's the Illustration Academy perspective of all these great artists that have taught with us about the most important aspects of developing yourself as an artist. I'm done. Timmy, do we have any questions? Thank you. That was really great. Um... If anybody, if you feel overwhelmed by all of that information, I mean, I know it's a lot of information. Uh, if we were to have really unpacked it, we'd be here all night and tomorrow as well. Um, but these are the things that you really need to know. Uh, that being said, I am going to send out a recording to this chat. Um, it'll be out in email tomorrow. So if you had slides you wanted to look at, more like that, um, just keep an eye out on your email. Um, and like John said, this class is enrolling. So if 
if you're really wanting to understand everything we talked about in great detail, that class, John, I mean, it's perfect for that. And um, that being said, for uh, the rest of the weekend, we have a discount code, draw more. I dropped it in the chat. You could save $50 on this course. Um, it's five weeks. Uh, it's, a, it's a real workshop uh, for if you're considering art school, even if you're not sure about attending art school, this, this mentorship is, it really creates the path that puts you on, you know, creates that compass for a career, right? I mean. Well, the other thing that happens with all of our five-week classes, those students can go to our study hall and you can, you can see our full program and you can see, yeah. you can see the artists, the, what the, the, the level the students are working at, and you can talk to and meet uh, a bunch of professional artists. I always have to remind myself too, you know, this is a webinar that we're hosting right now. Yeah. Classes are not webinars. They're meeting. Like you will be meeting with John. You'll be held accountable by your fellow students. You'll be ac held accountable by your instructors, study hall. I mean, it's a, you are going to build relationships with these people. Uh, I want to say that because it's easy to forget. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I, I hope that, um, Again, I don't know if there's any other questions, Timmy. I, yeah, does anybody have, you know, let's, we'll give it a few seconds to give it uh, some questions. I'm sure um, people are ready to move on with the rest of Saturday, but that, that John, that was really in, in detail. If you do have uh, <laughs> more detailed questions uh, about, um, about the schools you're choosing, about your decision, you can email us at hello at visualartspassage.com. And uh, that, that goes right to me and John, and we will get back to you. My favorite question in here, who is his dad? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Marvel artist. Yeah. Wesley Burt. That is correct. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. He's a monster. He's great. Yep. Another one to look into is Carlo Ortiz. Yep. Uh, but, well, yeah, there's um, how the list just goes on. And yeah. On. Tyler, Tyler Jacobson. Yeah, uh, we're just going to start name dropping. Vance um, Kovacs. Yeah, they're yeah, all awesome. Um, well, that was great. I hope everybody enjoyed it. If you do have questions, feel free to email us. Cool. Uh, I'm so totally worn out. And thank you, everybody, for sitting through that. And I hope I said something to benefit you. I think it was great. Thanks well, so much. Have a nice weekend. Everybody, thank you. <laughs>